All right, well, we'll get started here and uh, he can jump in in progress. So uh, just just to kind of get us started here, why don't you tell us a little bit, there's Bob, um, about uh, kind of what how you arrived at this decision to run for one of the most unpopular jobs in the country and uh, <laughs> what uh, what what what's possessed you to to take that on? Well, I'll take you back to my upbringing, first of all. Um, my mom and dad were both World War II vets, and they really valued their involvement in the community. So um, my dad was on the school board, and he was on the County Conservation Commission. My mother was uh, in the nurse's cadet program in World War II, and then she became the town doctor's nurse. So, you know, she was very involved in the community and healing the community. She had been a teacher in a one-room schoolhouse before that. But uh, mom and dad brought us up. I had two other sisters. They brought us up doing chores. And so I was out hanging cattle and feeding the cattle long before, you know, the sun was coming up. And uh, we bailed hay and we did all the stuff that farm kids do. Um, when something broke, my dad fixed it himself. He learned how to do a lot of that on the farm growing up himself and, and in the military. Um, he was the first no-till farmer in the 1970s in Clinton County. He went to an ISU extension service training and decided to start no-till farming. And my mom and dad really had arguments over where that field was gonna go. And my dad wanted everybody to see it. And my mom didn't want anybody to see it because it was filled with weeds. And so uh, three daughters and three sides, and we went out and kept the, the, the field clean. But um, you know, upon rotating from soybeans to corn back to soybeans, you know, the commodity, um, the yields grew and the commodity prices were growing at the same time. So um, my dad was an experimenter, an innovator. They were both involved in community. So that's kind of where my roots are. And I did tasseled corn and I mowed the cemetery, the local cemetery, to pay my way through journalism uh, school at Iowa. So I went to a state uh, regents institution. So from there, uh, journalist for nearly 30 years, um, I covered the farm crisis. I covered uh, a lot of political stories. So, you know, I was able to interview every presidential hopeful, as you all are, from uh, Reagan to Obama and uh, cover just a, just a lot of meetings. And um, and then, you know, uh, just, you know, it was a skill set for being an effective legislator as well. So, um, I was a Warburg professor in the middle of two different uh, television jobs. So I worked, you know, at the NBC affiliate in Waterloo and then at the ABC affiliate in Cedar Rapids. And then in between that, um, as, a, as a professor teaching First Amendment law, the rights of reporters um, to future journalists. And then, um, you know, then I went on to um, join a nonprofit. It, the agency is Four Oaks and they help kids who have mental health issues. So residential treatment, there's a PMIC there, a psychiatric uh, medical institute for children. Um, we did foster care and adoption and a lot of case management in about 15 cities. At the time that I joined the agency, there were between 900 and 1,000 employees uh, all over Eastern Iowa. So I helped them with communications, internal and external, and then um, decided after attending a couple of legislative meetings as an advocate for children's mental health that we really needed somebody in the state house to talk about children and, and mental health. I just, you know, I watched a lot of people who were on the stump and they really didn't say the word children. It never really crossed their lips. It might have been students or kids or whatever, but they but they really didn't talk about children or the mental their mental health. In fact, I, we went to an appropriations meeting. There was a big group of advocates, and they talked about adult mental health for about an hour and children's mental health for about ten minutes. And so there was an opportunity to run for state senate. In a special election, Swati Dan Dakar was my state senator. She decided to resign and join the Iowa Utility Board um, when asked by Terry Branstad. So the significance of this is that it was the single Democratic seat for the majority in the Senate. So we had a Republican uh, governor at the time, uh, a Republican House, and the Democrats held by a very thin one-seat majority. So it was, uh, I was number 26. Move on. So, Move on. We, we, we won 
uh, we won that seat and um, and it was mm -hmm. terrific. And then I went on to win all the other uh, elections that I was up for. So in the Senate, I did a lot of work around um, the children's mental health system. I helped create that uh, with help from the governor's office and also from a lot of mental health advocates. And um, I did some bipartisan work that we called Meet Mondays. There were uh, a group of um, uh, agricultural um, uh, legislators, so three people from uh, the Agapropes uh, Committee, and they were Republicans, and two others from the Agapropes Committee. And I asked them if they wanted to go out for dinner on Monday nights for meat, M E A T Mondays, at the Big Steer in Altoona. And that's what we did to try to make sure that we were extending the olive branch and we were talking about things in bipartisan fashion. In fact, I asked them if they would go out and talk about things other than politics. So, so I've tried to do everything that I can in the state Senate, and um, and I'm moving on to Congress. I think that uh, one of one of the key issues that we're hearing from from citizens n nationwide, and I think it's polling as the the most the predominant issue in Iowa, uh, is inflation and pocketbook issues. So um, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about that and what plans you might have to. Uh, help Iowans with as we're facing higher prices uh, across the board from the grocery store to the gas pump? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, gas prices are really going in the right direction. And I will be championing, you know, biofuels and energy independence in any way possible and hold uh, oil and gas companies who are making record profits, as you all know, uh, accountable for any price gouging. And uh, the House did pass a price gouging bill, which Ashley Hinson did not vote for. Um, and um, she actually took about $110,000 from uh, big oil. So I'll continue to fight to bring down prices where and when we can. And I think the Inflation Reduction Act is a great example of how uh, members of the House and the Senate are talking about bringing down health care costs. So um, you know, that is a day-to-day -day expense. We've seen how healthcare costs, the insulin cap uh, at $35 is great for seniors. Um, we need it for every diabetic in the state of Iowa, if not across the country. Um, uh, Ashley Hinson wrote an editorial saying that she wanted a cap, but she voted against it. She took $50,000 from the drug industry and, and their talking points. Uh, and and uh, she meets with her lobbyists on a regular basis. But I want to make sure that people know that uh, the bill that is the Inflation Reduction Act is also reducing the deficit by uh, about $300 billion. Being able to negotiate uh, drug prices is going to save money in the long run. So, um, so when we talk about the national debt, that's a way to reduce the national debt as well. So costs for Iowans are... Um, especially gas prices going in the right direction. We're working on the supply chain. They're working on the ports. We're working on trying to get truck drivers behind the wheel. Um, we know that we have worker shortages and we're working on that as well. And I think Congress has passed uh, a few bills in the last couple of months that are certainly addressing some of our higher prices. So just a point of clarification, not being a smart aleck, but... Um... <laughs> Um, yesterday, the reports came out that um, the 98-day decline of gas prices going down had shifted and they're going back up. So mm -hmm. are you suggesting that gas prices going back up means they're heading the right direction? Well, I know that what's been done is helping. So what I'm suggesting is we know that we have a commitment to being independent with our energy production. We know that we have a commitment that there are a million barrels of oil being released from the reserves every day. And those reserves uh, are along the Gulf Coast. We know that we're working toward trying to bring gas prices down. E15 was approved for the entire country. And so those things have been put in place to continue to work on bringing down gas prices. And as a follow-up to that, Liz, um... I'm um, curious to your thoughts on with um, Iowa producing 
um, components for fuel for um, um, fossil fuels and and the the push in some in your party to move to a much more green environment, um, including uh, changes that the governor of California is requesting of car makers or mandating of car makers, um, and the president's um, pretty um, well stated plan or thoughts on um, fossil fuels. I'm curious to your thoughts on that, especially as it affects the economy in Iowa. Mm -hmm. Well, here's what I do know. We are a corn state. <laughs> Iowa is an agricultural state and we grow corn and soybeans and uh, we raise cattle and we have farrowing operations, raise pigs, sell, sell pork. So I'm very aware of that. And I'll continue to support farmers in every way possible to make sure that their commodity prices are high and that there is a market for their corn and soybeans. And one of those markets is ethanol. Now, um, you mentioned uh, electric vehicles. We know that Motortown, Detroit, is ready to, especially, if, I think it's Ford and I want to say General Motors, uh, has committed to going electric by 2035. That is a consumer issue. If the consumer wants electric vehicles, they will be buying electric vehicles. So I had a sit down with Tom Vilsack, our U.S. Ag Secretary, um, uh, just a couple of months ago when he was in town uh, talking about clean energy uh, projects through USDA. And one of the things I asked him was, okay, what happens when we have a collision between electric vehicles and our production of ethanol? And he said, that is not going to happen because he feels that the airline industry, which is testing uh, ethanol right now in their, um, you know, their uh, fuel, that they will need as much corn as is produced for ethanol right now and more for the airline industry. So he feels with the development of that, that is going to help shore up anything that um, might be transitioned into electric vehicles. But he assured me that it will take years. And you, you and I know that it is slow to, there are things that are slow to transition and to adapt. And there have to, there will need to be more electric fueling stations. You know, if we're talking about fuel, electricity is fuel as well. So there are electric charging stations there, and that's going to take some time. And, you know, the early adopters of the Prius, um, you know, there will be early adopters of the F-150. And there's a reason that Detroit is really promoting the pickup truck as one of their first electric vehicles. They want to show that it works. They want uh, people who uh, gravitate towards utility vehicles to be able to, you know, um, to get some confidence in it. So I think we have a lot of factors coming in, is what I'm saying. And there will be a very um, long transition and adaptation to electric vehicles in the future. Thank you. You, you mentioned a um, couple of things there about about uh, your opponent and groups that she's taken money from. And I guess I just want to talk a little bit about that in terms of, uh, you know, we, we've talked to, to <clears throat> members of Congress for many years. And I remember going back to uh, when Jim Nussel represented this area. And that was always one of the, he said that was one of the most shocking things for him when he got to Congress was how much time he was expected to spend raising money and mm -hmm. how challenging that was and how that's just kind of how, how it works these days uh, to, to run a successful campaign that you need, you know, you need to find money. So um, mm -hmm. how, how would you approach that to uh, maybe avoid if, if you think it's important to avoid taking money from groups that that maybe you don't want to feel beholden to or you don't want to be associated with. Um, what what does that look like for a congressman or woman today? Mm -hmm. Well, running for Congress is takes on a number of different layers. So first of all, you know, I think the most important part is that you're listening to your constituents. You're listening to voters and finding out, you know, why, you know, what they want changed. Uh, how you can help them, 
how does government really come into play with their regular daily lives? I mean, I the reason that I'm running for Congress, I, you know, I really want to continue to work for those who are not heard. So for children and those who have mental health problems, uh, they're challenged by mental health problems. Um, I was one of the people that uh, stood up very definitely when Medicaid was privatized to manage care. And I had a spreadsheet of about 150 names, uh, uh, you know, or people who needed help uh, with their Medicaid care. And, and so, um, you know, why am I running for Congress? Because they have rural roots. Um, I understand rural issues. Uh, Washington is a divisive mess. I mean, uh, we need to work in a bipartisan fashion. And I'll work with anybody to get things done for Iowans. Um, the Republicans are kind of into the culture wars right now. And Democrats, as I've said on my ad, Democrats need to work on getting costs down for people. But Ashley Hinson is voting against, I think, what's best for Iowans. And, and her votes don't reflect Iowa values. She has a pattern of saying one thing uh, for Iowa and then voting against Iowans in DC, very definitely. For uh, example, infrastructure. So infrastructure will bring $5 billion of our federal tax money back into this state to uh, rebuild 4,000 endangered bridges, to make sure that our broadband is extended, to make sure that our roads are good. And she voted no. And then a couple of weeks later, she told everybody that she was at the front of a project that was successfully moving forward, but it was with the help of infrastructure money. And so she took credit for this project and people reacted uh, very strongly because you don't vote no and then you take the dough. You just don't do that. The other, the other uh, 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 bill that she voted against was ARPA. So the ARPA uh, money is coming into the state of Iowa for children's uh, you know, daycare centers and for a lot of projects all over the state. And she voted no on that. And yet she goes out and she touts that she's helping moms or she's, she is um, supporting daycare centers or she is you know, supporting housing. And she voted no on that funding. So, so you asked me originally you know, if, um, if campaigning is hard. Yes, it's hard. And there are parts of campaigning that probably, especially the fundraising part, that just sometimes are not sustainable. You are on the phones a lot. I absolutely acknowledge that. But at the same time, I have really tried to get out and listen to people. And I've been all over the 22 counties that make up this congressional district. We've gone to uh, firefighter steak fries. We've been to pancake breakfasts. We've been to farmer's markets. Um, we've talked to people at, um, I think we went to 14 county fairs and we've been in parades. And, you know, you just want to see where people live and they work and listen to their stories about what they need. Because in rural areas, we need health care. We need access to health care and we need housing. But very definitely, we need housing built in rural areas. So, rural areas won't dry up and die. We don't want that to happen. We have to have people be able to live in the cities where they're working. And that's very important to you know rural Iowa. But Ashley Hinson voted against the bill that would have helped create that. There's a lot of ARPA money going into affordable housing right now. And she voted no on it. I just toured uh, a project in Mason City. And it's um, they had 180 units that were built and immediately were filled. And then they're rebuilding some uh, some other units above storefronts in Mason City. And it's a very unique program. They're using ARPA money. And those uh, a couple of those are already leased and they still don't have, they don't have drywall up and they're already leased. So those kinds of things are needed in rural Iowa to help rural Iowa survive and thrive. And Ashley Hinson voted against that. Can you can you give uh, the Democrats in in Washington uh, kind of your take as to how um, the immigration situation, where it's at today, and 
has how that's been going under the Democrats watch? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that we can all agree the immigration system is broken. It just really is. And Congress has not addressed it. And we need safe and secure borders, absolutely. And uh, in order to crack down on cartels and any kind of drugs that are coming across the border. So um, we've got to enter this, though, through some legal channels here. So um, we don't need any fear mongering. And my opponent is doing that. And um, we don't need another humanitarian crisis either. So what I see that needs to be done is to propose some um, effective and certainly some comprehensive reform. We've got to do that. So more technology to monitor the border and to process paperwork is really needed. Um, we need uh, more patrol agents. Absolutely. Um, when you uh, listen to people uh, about uh, the work that they're doing at the border, they, they need help. And then we have to streamline our immigration system with a clear path to citizenship. Absolutely. And a lot of people have been talking about it for a long time, and it absolutely needs to get done. I have toured the Catherine McCauley Center here in Lynn County, and they work with so many people who are immigrating here. And uh, they work on uh, language barriers and they work on other barriers like daycare, uh, you know, for people who don't speak the language and their children. And we want to make sure that uh, they feel welcome, that we are able to get them into job training uh, programs, that we're able to help them assimilate into our communities. And we see some very positive results from that. We really do. But to streamline the immigration system is imperative for our country, and we've got to have a clear path to citizenship on that. Uh, just kind of a follow-up on that. So why, I mean, why hasn't that happened yet? I mean, I think we've been talking about this for, for years, and then some of the things you're saying are kind of the same platitudes that that are thrown out every election season. What what's standing in the way of this, or what would you do if elected to actually get get that done? Yeah, Dustin, that is a really good question. So, I was at a state legislative meeting with Republicans and Democrats in the room, and the CEO of High V was at the front of the room, and he begged and pleaded and said, "Please." do all you can to straighten out immigration in this country because we need workers. We absolutely have to have people who are willing to work at our stores and we're not able to recruit them from where, you know, we're short on workers right now in the state of Iowa. So I heard that and I know my Republican friends heard that, but the bills that we saw from the Republican majority were bills about uh, cracking down on uh, on uh, immigrants, and it was on uh, sanctuary cities. You know, uh, eliminating sanctuary cities. So it were it was things that were opposite of what our businesses are really asking us for. So uh, why is it not moving forward? I think uh, I can speak at a state level. It's not moving forward because the Republican majority doesn't want it to move forward. So uh, that would be one of the things that I would work on in Congress is definitely trying to work with people across the aisle to come to some form of, uh, of compromise, if you will, and get that clear path to citizenship going. We just have to do that. We absolutely have to do it. Not only does the state of Iowa depend on that and is hinging on that, and our workforce, but the rest of the nation is as well. So in, in talking to potential voters uh, as you're campaigning, I mean, what are, obviously we've hit inflation, we've talked about immigration. Um, what other what other kind of makes their most pressing issue list and, and what solutions do you offer for those issues? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have to say that 
I hear most often pocketbook issues. So that's one thing uh, about inflation, about the high costs of groceries and gas. And we've already talked about that. So you, you know what I think about that. Um, but also um, Social Security and Medicare. So um, we've heard Rick Scott and Ron Johnson talk about sunsetting, you know, uh, social services or federal systems or federal programs. And uh, people are nervous about that. And we cannot sunset Social Security and Medicare. Um, we can, um, you know, we've heard them talk about raising the retirement age and cutting the benefits and uh, secret meetings that they've talked about in D.C. to cut Social Security um, if the GOP gets the majority. And uh, I will not stand for that. I will make sure that Social Security and Medicare are always there for people. I've, I've seen how that worked with my own family. My mom and dad were sick at the same time. My dad had congestive heart failure. Actually, they lived in Bellevue and he was seeking treatment in Dubuque and was transferred for the, to the U of I. And I, you know, he would never have been able to get the care that he, um, you know, was getting if Medicare were cut and Social Security the same. So my father was taking care of my mother who had Parkinson's. So that was a, uh, that was a really, really um, difficult issue for them and for me because I had the power of attorney and, uh, and I was, was taking care of all of their medical costs and things. And so um, dad sub subsequently passed away before my mom. And um, my mom was able to still get Social Security benefits, and she was able to get Medicare for her treatment. And, um, and it worked very well that she was able to stay in, she, she was hospitalized for a while. She was able to stay in skilled nursing while she recovered, and Medicare paid that bill. Um, I, I can't imagine um, if, you know, people were left without, it would be disastrous for our country and for our elderly and for everybody else who's taking care of them. So, um, so it just really has to stay in place. The other thing that I've been hearing at the door has been reproductive rights. So in 10 years that I've been a state senator, I've knocked on thousands of doors, not only for myself, <laughs> but for a lot of other people um, across the state that have been you know, running. And I can probably say I've counted on one hand over 10 years the times that I've talked about reproductive rights at the door. I started uh, knocking on doors in July, um, and I just wanted to personally go out and see what people were saying. I think it's probably my journalism background that I wanted to hear it. I didn't want to read it in notes from someone else who had gone to the doors. And in Dubuque, I had a list of 30 households and I was able to find 21 people at home. And out of those 21 people, every single person wanted to talk about reproductive rights at the door. I made notes and I went back to our campaign headquarters and I said, this is really on people's minds that, um, you know, uh, women have had a constitutional right to uh, legal safe abortion for 50 years. And all of a sudden, you know, it's going to be taken away. And so people are, are you know, they want to talk about it. How do we restore that? Iowans do not want government mandates and extreme overreach. They just don't want it. And they're telling me that. And um, I believe that people like politicians like Ashley Henson, should not be making personal health care decisions for Iowans. And we can see poll after poll, and um, and maybe your competitor, the Des Moines Register, has the Iowa poll that, with Ann Seltzer. We even see that year after year, the majority of Iowans want legal abortions. And I will codify that if I get to Washington. We know that the conversations around reproductive rights have included ectopic pregnancies and miscarriage and abnormalities and medical school. 
where will OBGYN residents get their full rotation on OBGYN if they are in a state that has outlawed abortion? How will that affect our maternal health care for everyone if people like Ashley Hinson want to criminalize doctors, want to put them in jail, want health care workers to go to jail if they are part of a, an abortive act? And that's just wrong. So I think she's too extreme. She's co-sponsored a complete abortion ban, including rape, incest, and the life of a mother. A complete ban. And that's just wrong. So those are the things that people are talking with me at the door about. And and with the shift uh, on, on the abortion issue to, to be coming under state purview, how how could you, what sort of um, legislation could you, could be enacted federally uh, that might, might have an impact on that? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll ask you just the opposite. Lindsey Graham's uh, bill that he is proposing is a federal proposal. So we can codify Roe. We get, keep the majority, the majority in the Senate, Roe can be codified. Hi, Liz. Bob Woodward, um, the publisher here. And a uh, question for you. I don't know what you're hearing um, on the uh, campaign trail about um, uh, gun violence, um, right to bear arms, Second Amendment rights, but also uh, restrictions in terms of uh, um, gun use, purchase, registration. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, what you hear and where you fall on that issue. Mm -hmm. Well, I've always been a supporter of Second Amendment rights. And um, I grew up on a farm, so I was around guns there. We had a lot of hunters on our land. My dad hunted. And so I am supportive of those who want to collect guns, those who use guns for hunting. So I'm also a supporter of common sense reform. And I um, I believe that um, Ashley Henson does not has not done enough. She is allowing for criminals to have guns. She's allowing uh, access for those who could self harm, and so uh, we could be doing something differently around that. I will support universal background checks and red flag laws. Because Iowans want these. Time and time again, we've seen polls uh, and Iowans have talked about this. They want common sense reform. They want universal background checks. And they want to make sure that people are safe. They want to make sure that public safety is strong. So that's my opinion on the Second Amendment. Well, is a significant um, development for people in in our part of the state is has been the um, loss of commercial air service out of the Dubuque Regional Airport, um, and and I know uh, uh, full transparency. I serve on the Air Service Task Force Committee, you know, which is sponsored by the Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce. And at the politics and eggs get together um, uh, here a few weeks ago, you you had indicated that. Um, more should have been done or you would have done more. I can't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but something along those lines yes. uh, keep, to keep air service in Dubuque. And I'm curious specifically what you could have done to keep air service here or what you might be able to do uh, if elected. Mm -hmm. Well, I watched Abby Finkenauer work really hard to keep airline service in Dubuque. So, you know, I asked her about this and I know that there are multiple factors uh, that determine, you know, airline routes and flight frequencies for different hubs. We know that there's it's market, you know, demographics and um, I think they call it a load factor, load factor and some profitability and, you know, just essential air service and government funding. Um, and then um, I know that you paid landing fees too and other costs to the airline, but there is political influence that is can be factored into these decisions. 
And this is a time where when you're a congresswoman, you use your clout to make sure that the airlines hear you loud and clearly to open or close a market. And so I have, um, you know, I've talked to the pilots union. They don't feel there's an airline. They don't think that there's a pilot shortage, but I've talked to uh, airport managers. So Marty uh, Lenz is an airport manager here in Cedar Rapids. And he keeps bringing up in legislative discussion that there is a pilot shortage. So somewhere in between there, there's the truth, and I'm sure you'll find it. But the pilot shortage, if you look at if it is true, it could have been a key factor for American Airlines to, you know, I think you, you were one of four markets um, that that they uh, chose to close. But, um, you know, other markets um, very well could have kept uh, been kept due to um, some political pressure and congressional members' relationships and regular meetings taken with airline decision makers. That's what you do when you're a leader. That's what you do when someone from Dubuque calls you and says, what can we do to keep our airline here? What can we do to keep our airport open? That's something that your member of Congress should be fully involved in because that has to do with your infrastructure and transportation. And it, you, you just have to get involved. And I don't feel that she's done enough. Thank you. Do you hear much about climate change from Iowans and how, I guess, would you sort of reconcile what what might be a um, popular uh, topic in, in Washington, D.C. with how Iowans feel about it? Yeah. Well, yes, I hear a lot about climate, too. And usually when I open up uh, my speeches, you know, to different groups, uh, someone asks me about climate and what my, you know, what my views are. And we know, we meaning uh, those who live on the river, right, in Dubuque and Cedar Rapids, we know that extreme weather events are extremely costly um, to all Iowans, whether you live in a home that's along the river or you have a small business. Um, it is uh, It affects our ag economy and it affects government. We saw that here in Cedar Rapids when the flood hit, you know, City Hall and the federal building and the jail and all of that all of our infrastructure, it's very costly. In fact, one, one side story, um, my clerk in the state Senate is Beth Freeman. And she used to work as the regional director for FEMA in uh, Kansas City. So she's been very helpful in telling me, um, you know, uh, what FEMA can do after the derecho, uh, you know, after the floods, there was a flood, you know, on the Missouri. So she helped organize a tour with Chuck Grassley and Tom Shipley and Jackie Smith, people who lived on that side of the state. So that's just kind of a sidebar there. But my experiences, we had a we had a stream that ran through our farm and it flooded every year. And so that's why my dad kind of decided he was going to try no-till because he was worried about so much soil, you know, um, going downstream. Um, and with flooding in Cedar, Ra Cedar Rapids, you know, and I've covered a lot of weather disasters, a lot of things I've watched, you know, towns move, you know, Littleport and, you know, di different towns moving, um, but also a lot of destruction, you know, to people's property. So um, I want to tackle climate crisis by investing in new energy research and technologies and um, we can do that by increasing our help, you know, or our, our um, processes around biofuels. Uh, we know that we can uh, tackle the way that biofuels are made by decreasing carbon. Um, we can use more wind, which we have a lot of in the state of Iowa, and solar. Solar arrays are going up. In fact, I just looked at this. This is a USDA report on um, how many. Uh, projects, USDA projects uh, were uh, spurned by um, ARPA funds and by uh, infrastructure funds. So I was looking through that to see, to see that. Um, and we know that energy independence is huge because it will reduce greenhouse gas. 
So our focus should be on those things. Um, you know, farmers worry about the weather all the time. It's no different than when I was a kid and my dad was farming and uh, what farmers have now. Sure, hybrids are stronger. They resist drought a little bit longer and maybe flooding and those kinds of things, pests, uh, insects. Um, but we know that the weather is always going to be changing and some of the severe weather, the extreme weather, is coming on much more often than not. Any other uh, follow-up questions here for Liz? We're getting close to the end of our time. And, and go ahead, Dustin. Uh, the only, I guess, final question that I have is uh, we've talked a lot about Feels like we talked a lot about what's been happening in Congress recently, and um, talked a lot about what your opponent has done or hasn't done. Um, you know, without kind of mentioning her. I mean, when you're talking to an I, when you're trying to get the vote for you, how, what do you outline as kind of your vision for what, what, why they should back you versus Miss Henson? Mm -hmm. That's a good question because so I I can't mention some of the things that she's doing, you know. Um, what well, here's here are my priorities that I want to do when I get to Congress. A absolutely, I want to work on lowering costs for Iowans, no matter what it is. If it's healthcare or housing or childcare costs, I want to lower costs. I'm going to protect Social Security and Medicare. Absolutely, that is priority number one and I'm going to protect reproductive rights. I think those are the three top challenges that we have right now. And if elected, I will make sure that I will be focused on all of those. But we know that, um, you know, we've got to continue to uh, support our economy and manufacturing. We need to make sure that we have infrastructure investments. I um, want to support small business as much as I can. And our healthcare, you know, uh, my background in mental health is, um, is pretty extensive uh, because I worked for Four Oaks and I understand it. And I understand that it's very lacking out in our rural areas. We've got to get going with it. And I have an idea that I want to take to Congress in terms of access, you know, treatment centers that we've started here in Iowa. We need to keep going on that. We need to keep pressing throughout Iowa to get more access treatment center, mental health access treatment centers up. And we need to make sure that our maternal health care is strong out in the rural areas. So those are the some of the things that I think um, need to be worked on. But I've got to tell you that my opponent is not concentrating on those things. Um, she voted against the January 6th committee. She voted against the Violence Against Women's Act. She voted against... Uh, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. She voted against infrastructure, against the Inflation Reduction Act. She voted against the PACT Act, which is the most comprehensive health care bill for veterans that we've seen since Agent Orange in Vietnam. So she voted against that the first time around. And then, you know, a lot of advocates stormed the Capitol, including John Stewart, and then she voted yes for it. So, you know, which way will it be? Uh, where's the flip-flopping? She's really good at it. Well, we covered a lot of ground today. Appreciate you taking the time to, to meet with us and um, wish you luck the rest of the way. Thank you, Amy. Thanks for your time. Yay, thank you. Thanks thank you very much, everybody. I enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks, Liz. Bye.